we have to understand how well the body operates because it doesn't matter how much calcium you eat if you can't absorb it. It doesn't matter how much protein you get in if you don't metabolize it properly. And the ground zero really starts in the gut. So looking at the gut also is really important because again, we have a lot of people that might be doing all the right things, maybe even taking the right supplements, but are you getting them, right? Are you getting them to where they need to go? Number one, I just covered a ton of genes that may be affecting that and other metabolic reasons why their things may be affecting it. But at the very basic level, understanding how your digestion works, even if you're not symptomatic, is also what I would consider a baseline. So poor dietary intake, poor dietary function and digestive function over time is going to cause a loss of bone mineral density as well just because your body can't build something it doesn't get right those nutrients are essential it can't do something that it's not getting you know so that's the problem with the standard american diet and why we see such an increase in just all cause mortality and diseases is it's devoid of nutrients and full of empty calories. So our body is hungrier because it's still asking for nutrients. And we have disease processes plowing around in the background because they're not getting the appropriate nutrition that they really need. Welcome to the Menopause Mastery Podcast, a show for women just like you who are ready for more health, vitality, passion, living life with a purpose. I created this show because I knew that women just like me in this second season of life, the season of menopause, are really tapping into their deepest desires. And we're ready to harness our physical and mental health and explore what our true passions are and peel back the layers to uncover exactly what we want out of life. I'm your host, Betty Murray, part geek, part magician, and your new medical bestie with a dash of sass. I love taking the complex science and making it easier to integrate into daily life. So let's join the journey to make this season the best ever. Hey there, are you over 40 and finding that a good night's sleep feels like a distant dream? Have no fear, I have cracked the code. I am offering a free ebook, A Woman's Guide to Kick-Ass Sleep, with insights tailored just for you. So, if you're ready to dive into the secrets of sound sleep after 40 and wake up refreshed, zip over to sleep.hormoneshelp.com and snag that ebook. Your dreamy sleep awaits. Welcome back to Menopause Mastery. So today, this is by special request. I have a lot of people that are in my Facebook group, Banish Belly Fat for Women Over 40, and then followers on Instagram and my social media. And I got a lot of feedback recently that I have not been giving enough love to osteoporosis. And so today I wanna to talk a little bit about some of the things, the basic things that you need to understand about your risk for osteoporosis, particularly as a woman. Not to say that a man doesn't carry this risk, but it's significantly less than it is for women. And, you know, in our clinic in Dallas and then online as the functional medicine expert for the international organization Bone Coach, this is one of my like deep dive special, you know, specialties is really understanding all the different ways in which metabolic changes, genetic changes and other things may be contributing to bone loss, particularly as we age. So I'm going to deep dive it today. So if you don't have osteoporosis, don't skip over this recording and assume that you don't need to listen because the reality is it falls and breaks from poor bone health are the leading cause of death in adults over 55 that is accidental, right? So it's not necessarily the break that kills them. It's the infection and other things that does it you know, that basically kicks in afterwards. So it is actually a very significant problem. And especially after 20 years of the Women's Health Initiative and women being basically terrorized about hormone replacement, we now have an epidemic of osteoporosis in our population. So let's get into it and let's get down to the nitty gritty on your bones and how to take care of them and what causes osteoporosis. So osteoporosis obviously is a bone disease characterized by reduced bone density and quality, which leads to weak bones and more fragile bones, which are more prone to fracture. And there's a bunch of different risk factors. And I'm going to talk about first just the top five, the ones that everybody gets quoted, but I'm going to deep dive into some of the more technical aspects of osteoporosis risk. So first off is number one, if you're female, you carry a greater risk for osteoporosis 
Yay. And, and it is because of sex hormone changes. So imbalances and particularly the reduction of estrogen levels during the menopause and perimenopausal transition, and also low testosterone, both in men and women, can lead to osteoporosis. And part of this is because estrogen is vital for bone health because it actually helps accelerate the differentiation and the production of osteoblasts, which think of those are our construction crew. So you have the blasts that build and you have the clasts that destroy. So osteoclasts on the opposite hand are the demolition crew that come in and clean up old, damaged and frail bones. And at any given time, our body is going through this process constantly. So the first thing to know is bone turnover and your body's rebuilding and reconstruction and breaking down of bones happens all the time, right? Otherwise, you would have very poor bone structure because you don't want your body producing more bone on top of bone that is that is not good quality. I think it's like crumbling bricks. You wouldn't want to do that. That would not make the foundation worthy. And that's how the body gets signals to actually build the bone. It's through these little mechanisms back and forth. And there's an inflammatory activity by NF-kappa B and a thing called rankle and interleukin-6. Those are cytokines that actually can stimulate increased activity of this osteoclast group, you know, the demolition crew. But the reality is in all women, as we enter into perimenopause to menopause, and it's actually in that period of transition, not just once you've gone completely through through menopause, but it's actually in that accelerated activity right at the end where most of us started getting a lot of symptoms. If it wasn't, you know, eight years prior on average, definitely it's where you started getting the weirder periods and more spread out. We actually see an acceleration that occurs really honestly before your periods completely stop. So it's not like you have to wait for that to occur. And now you newly have osteoporosis risk. It's actually present just in the hormonal changes for women. Now, women also carry a greater risk if they are petite. So if you are shorter, if you are like, you know, under 5'4 and your average weight was under 120 for most of your adult life, you never probably had really good bone strength and bone density unless you were an impact athlete, like a gymnast. And part of the reason is that just carrying extra body weight, just having a larger frame like a man or a woman who is of taller and bigger stature increases bone density. Basically, the more weight you carry around, the more you have to move around, the more muscle mass you have, the more dense the bones. So women have sort of a double whammy because we are smaller in size and we also have all those sex hormones factors that sort of trigger in. So if you're Caucasian, you have a greater risk. Also East Asia and Asia, again, because of bone structure and smaller build. And actually in those countries, the set points and the optimal ranges for bone mineral density and the risk process and profile for osteoporosis is slightly different than what we see in the United States. And that's just because as a population, they are smaller in build. But of course, what that also means, if you're a good person that sort of asks questions, it's like, what if I'm only 5'1 and I never got over 110 pounds? Well, you would fall into that same body structure, right? So, you know, most everything in the United States is based on an average body weight of 150 pounds, right? So if you're underneath that, your risk is greater. So being a female, we automatically carry that risk right? So age, obviously, as we get older, especially if we're going into menopause, that happens in most places, you know, in most women, the average age is 51, 52 in the United States. So somewhere in our late 40s, early 50s, we're going to see an increased risk. But as we get older, and part of what drives this is we start to see peak of your bone density at about age 30, right? So we peak out at about age 30. And if you're more physically active and you've been doing weight training, or if you were, like I said, an impact athlete, like a gymnast, an impact like landing, right? Hitting the ground with hard bumps, right? That actually increases bone mineral density because of the vibration it sends up through the feet. And it actually increases the osteoblast activity. So it increases bone density. So gymnasts have some of the best bones in the industry. Right now, most gymnasts aren't still doing gymnastics at 30. So where they started may not be where they ended. So we peak out at age 30 ish. Right. And then it's kind of a downhill slope. 
And so by the time most women get tested, now the recommendations in the United States is that women get a DEXA scan, which is a low radiographic scan that looks at the bone and picks up whether the bone looks dense or not. And it has its own advantages and disadvantages. It's a gross examination of the bone. Believe me, it is by no means an end all be all for are my bones healthy and what's the quality of the bone. There are other analysis that can be done. There's echo light, which is now available in some some cities across the United States is still not widely available. It's a sonogram technology, so it doesn't have radiation and so you don't have to worry about repeated exposures. And it is better at picking up the bone quality, right? So that tells us what's that interior of the bone. So think of like the bone marrow and what they call the trabecular bone is the growing insides of the bone. That tells us is the bone strong and is it able to take tension? Not so much is it just dense? Because here's the way to think about it porcelain is dense, right? So I can't see through a porcelain bowl, right? So on a DEXA, it's going to look dense. If I drop it on the ground, is it likely to shatter? Yes. Now, if I look at something, I'm trying to think what would be a good example, a stick, right? So a stick actually has an exterior pattern of bark on the outside, it has the interior rings. And as you get into the inside of the rings on the tree, it gets tighter and tighter, you know, as the rings grow that every year there's an extra ring, right? But interior of the stick itself off a tree, there's a tight weave there. So think of that as kind of the inside of the trabecular bone. So if I've got a lot of concentric circles that are very close together, I'm going to have very good tensile strength, meaning I can take that stick and I can sort of bend it, but I probably can't break it, right? If you've ever pulled a stick off of a tree and tried to break it just by doing that, it's not easy. It flexes under tension, right? So good quality to trabecular bone flexes under tension. Now, the difference between like an echo light is it can pick up the interior of the stick all the way out to the outside, right? The bark outside. A DEXA is penetrating through, but it doesn't quite clearly pick up the quality of trabecular bone. So it's more like visualizing the bark on the outside. It's more like looking at a piece of porcelain. It doesn't necessarily tell you the tensile strength. Can it take force without breaking and shattering? Because that's truly what's valuable. A dense bone that's still highly fragile is not helpful. A good dense bone that is strong and can take tensile strength and flex and groove a little bit is going to be much better. So as we age, we see kind of a loss of this bone. And the other part of that too is it's, it's really honestly because of loss of muscle mass. At the same time that we're losing bone density, we're also losing muscle mass. And this starts to accelerate once we hit 40 and beyond, unless we are actively working to change that. Now, if I'm trying to prevent bone loss and I don't have any high risk factors like my bone density looks good, I have, don't have stress fractures, I could probably get into some serious weight training, right? Because the truth is little five and 10 pound arm weights and little ankle weights while you're walking are, isn't going to do jack s to your bones. I just need you to understand that. You need to pump some iron. We need to do some hardcore lifting. Now, if you've never done that before, it'd be a good idea to get a trainer and, and work with somebody. Ideally, if you have osteoporosis that is well scared, skilled and understands training for osteoporosis, because that's a whole different game. That's why I'm involved with the bone coach, because we have experts in every arena that understand those things. You can't just roll into a 24 hour fitness or planet fitness and hire the first trainer you see. If you have osteoporosis, you have a high risk of them giving you workouts that are not safe for you, right? So remember that age, loss of bone mass and loss of muscle mass are all interrelated, right? So the more we hold on to that muscle mass, the more we'll hold on to our bone mass. Now, we also have nutritional factors, right? There's calcium, vitamin D, vitamin K2, micro minerals like boron, all of these are essential for bone health, right? Now, what's interesting is if you go look at the literature and look at calcium replacement, like, right? okay, most of the studies looked at just calcium alone, it didn't show to help at all, right? And the reason is all of your nutrients. So this is one of the most important things as a nutritional researcher and nutritional professional I want to get across. Nothing in your body ever works in isolation, ever. Think of it this way. If you're baking a cake, you can't do anything with flour if you don't have other stuff with it, like eggs and water and oil or butter or something. You have to have things that sort of bring those ingredients together and create a batter. 
So your vitamins and minerals are like this too. They don't work in, so if you just give calcium and you don't have adequate vitamin D or you don't have adequate K2, which actually helps pull calcium into the bone matrix and helps actually get the calcium where it needs to go and keeps the calcium from calcifying or hardening your arteries, you're not gonna get anywhere. So it is part of the scaffolding and the structure that builds the bone itself. But it's not the only thing. There's cal appetite, there's proteins, there's collagen, there's all these other nutritional factors that make up the scaffolding and then the interior structure and the ingredients to bake that bone cake, right? So think of it that way. So you need all of them and, you know, a very low calcium diet, right? So if you're not eating, not, I'm not here to argue dairy or not dairy or green vegetables or not green vegetables, but the reality is if your dietary calcium is low, you are going to run into a risk, especially as we age, of the body actually pulling calcium out of the bone to stabilize calcium levels in the blood. We have amount we need to get on a regular basis. And if you're in that perimenopause, menopausal state, you're looking at, particularly if you've got some bone density issues, at least 1,200 milligrams a day spread out in small amounts through dietary intake first, supplementation when you can't meet it with diet, right? Which is a bigger conversation, but just recognize that your nutrients that you must get from food or supplement adequately with need to show up together in the right combinations and in a body that can absorb them so you can actually get them. So nutritional factors absolutely can contribute. The other thing is K2, right? K2 is a fat soluble form of K and it is found mostly in either a fermented for a soybean product called natto. And that's like if you're getting it from a supplement, in most cases, it's a fermented form, or it's also found in organ meats and other things. So if you're a vegetarian or vegan, your intake of K2 is going to be critically low. And I can tell you almost universally across the board, every woman I've seen that has osteoporosis, before we started working together and we started looking at nutritional levels, almost always was low in K2, right? So alone, is that the only player, right? No, but it is absolutely going to contribute. So nutritional factors, those adequate nutrients, vitamin D levels that are somewhere I recommend usually like 40 to 80, somewhere in that ballpark range all the time because it, it helps inform K and calcium where to go. It also is an immune modulator. It, it is a hormone in the body. So it's incredibly important. And then lifestyle factors, right? So there's physical act inactivity, right? So again, if you're not moving heavy weight, not just your body, walking won't do it. Your body adapts to that pretty easily. Definitely some impact and resistance related Pilates can be okay. But if you're healthy and you don't have osteoporosis to begin with, my recommendation is get into some serious weight training, not just a few pounds. You need to load and you need to load heavy. So physical inactivity can do that. And what I found too is a lot of women during COVID between 2019 DEXA scans and like 2021, a lot of women saw significant changes in their DEXA scans in that time period. And is it because of inflammatory activity of COVID? Potentially, because any inflammation can increase those inflammatory cytokines like interleukin-6, rankle, NF-kappa B, all those kind of things. So could just chronic inflammation absolutely contribute? Yeah, because it does. But this is more from the inactivity that happened from people being sequestered at home, gyms being closed, people not going outside and doing things and not doing their normal level of activity. It doesn't take long, especially as we age, to see significant loss in bone. One of the greatest risk factors for loss of muscle mass and loss of mobility in a senior citizen is an injury that keeps them bedridden for a period of time. So just in a matter of weeks, you can go from a fairly active senior citizen to a very inactive, if not impaired senior citizen, meaning you need support, whether it be a cane or a walker or something like that, just because of muscle mass loss, because you're fighting if you're not on hormone replacement and other things that basically keep instructing the body to, you know, protect your bones, your body's, you're fighting sort of this uphill battle to try and get your body to think that it needs to hold on to muscle, right? Where as we age, that's part of the aging process. So you have to give it all these stimulus that tell it, hey, we need to put on muscle, right? So physical inactivity. Smoking tobacco is also associated with reduced bone density and increased risk of fracture through driving inflammatory response. Smoking is so 
very damaging. Doesn't matter what kind, even if somebody's vaping. And it, it increases vascular inflammation and it increases all forms of cytokines. And that is going to increase bone mineral density problems and loss of bone mass without actually directly affecting bones. So it's not a direct effect. It's a direct effect of inflammatory activities of smoking. Excess alcohol consumption. So especially if we're drinking a lot of alcohol, that can affect bone remodeling and particularly bone calcium balance. So think of the activities of the construction crews, the demolition and the building crews get out of balance. So if I'm, you know, drinking a two glasses to a full bottle of wine at night because I'm unwinding because life is too stressful, I might very well be causing bone mineral density issues over time because of that bone rebuilding and remodeling imbalance. It leans towards the demolition crew. And then, like I said, low body weight. So anytime you've spent a significant portion of your life being underweight or just on the very low side of the weight scale for an adult female, you carry a greater risk, right? I mean, it's just the reality. I'm barely like I'm barely pushing five, three, right? So I'm not tall. I just have a tall personality. And so, you know, thankfully, I would say I don't, I was never like, you know, skirting the low end of the low 100s, but I'm also not 5'10 and 170 pounds either. So being underweight and a history of disordered eating. So if there is anorexia, bulimia, orthorexia, which is a, a form of eating disorder that has to do with eating really, and I'm doing air quotes here, clean, where you're restricting foods and they're healthy foods, but it actually leads to lack of food variety, nutrient deficiencies, and adequate food intake. So even on the healthy side, you can kind of lean too far one way. But if you had a history of that, so maybe you struggled with anorexia or bulimia or something like that as a young person, right? can absolutely do it. And it doesn't matter if it was 20 years ago, because it could have also been during that very critical 20 to 30 year old time span where you were had the best opportunity to put on bone, right? Because that means you started on the low end of the marker. You know, certain medications like corticosteroids, so things that we use that are for inflammation and or autoimmune conditions like rheumatoid arthritis, celiac, inflammatory bowel disease, absolutely can cause acceleration of the demolition crew. Some of the anti-convulsant drugs also have been shown to cause bone mineral density changes as well. So medications can also just lead to nutrient deficiencies, which secondarily lead to loss of bone mass as well. So let's talk a little bit about some deeper dive. I want to talk about two things that probably don't get enough airtime. You know, so when we look at the functional medicine community, obviously the first list that I just went over is our foundation, right? There's no reason to go look for esoteric things, right? Or more unique causes for osteoporosis until you've addressed these, right? So the things I just covered are your foundation. Those are a non, non, you have to do those because you can't, there's no way to leaky gut repair and fix your bone mineral density if you're not weight training and eating adequately and getting the right nutrients, okay? So think of those things as my foundation, that's the bottom of my house. So when I stack on top, so there are a bunch of things that can also create changes in bone mineral density that can affect it that are not as easily noticed, right? And often even some of your specialists that are helping you with your bones may not actually understand these mechanisms. So one of them is the genetic implication, right? So there's several genes that can affect bone mineral density and they run in families. So if you have family members that have bone mineral density, some of these may be part of this picture. So there's a gene called the vitamin D receptor gene or VDR. It's one of the most studied genes in osteoporosis. This gene plays a role in bone growth and remodeling by regulating directly calcium absorption. So if you have a slow VDR, meaning your receptor doesn't work very well, you're going to have less capacity to regulate calcium absorption from your intestines and your diet. And it has been shown to have an increased risk for bone mineral density problems. I am interested in bone mineral density because I was diagnosed with colitis. Later on, I'm celiac. And when I got my first bone mineral density, I was powerlifting at the time. And I'm talking heavy. I'm talking 800, 1600 pounds on a leg press for reps, not just a little bit, a lot. And I loved doing legs and, and lower body. So I was moving big muscle groups. And I went to get my bone mineral density done because I thought I was getting a baseline. And at the time I was pretty lean. I was definitely lean, but you know, I had quite a bit of muscle on me. I was very high muscle, 2% body fat. And what shocked me when I got it done, I was in my mid thirties was that 
my left femur was already in osteopenic range. Now, I got to give you the honest truth. Osteopenia is not a diagnosis. There is a variability either by plus one or minus one on any of the measures of your T-score that can indicate whether you are slightly above or below the average. And negative one is still considered in normal range. So osteopenia means starting to move that direction, but it is not diagnostic for osteoporosis. Is there a risk factor? Yes. And can it progress? Yes. But it's not a time where you you need to address it with drugs. I think that's an aggressive, egregious marketing ploy by the drug manufacturers. But it is a call to arms and a call to pay attention because it means that we're not as good with bone quality as what we could be. So vitamin D receptor gene, very commonly mutated. I have two mutations on that gene. And I still work very hard to make sure that I'm getting the right dietary calcium. I keep my vitamin D levels up and my K2 and I give A and E with it because the reality is I'm not that good at that step as maybe somebody else. Now, there's another one that's called collagen type 1 alpha gene. This gene codes for a component of type 1 collagen, and that's the primary collagen in bone. So when this gene is mutated, it leads to defect in collagen structure. So think of collagen sort of as the mortar within the scaffolding that the brick of calcium goes into. So if that collagen structure isn't very robust, I get crumbly mortar, right? It's not going to be very good. So that's going to affect bone strength. There's estrogen receptor alpha. So there's an estrogen receptor alpha and an estrogen receptor beta. The estrogen receptor one gene, alpha one gene, codes for how estrogen is going to attach and it plays a significant role in bone metabolism. Variations in this gene influence bone tissue response to estrogen, increasing osteoblast activity. So this is the receptor that your natural production of estrogen influences positively for your bones. So, hey, hate to break it to you, but the first and best intervention to protect bones is to maintain or replace estrogen as you're going through the menopause transition, right? It's not that you have a a surprising lack of bisphosphonates. It's because you're losing estrogen. And if you put estrogen in, that is what the body expects to help turn on this receptor and keep that remodeling activity going. You know what? Your hormones might be out of whack. Take my quiz to discover your personalized hormone imbalance and get a free report with your results. Learn what's really going on with your hormones and start feeling like yourself again. Just visit the website quiz.hormoneshelp.com to take the hormone quiz now. So estrogen receptor alpha is really important. There's also a receptor activator of nuclear factor kappa B ligand. All right, that's a mouthful. It's also known as rankle, R-A-N-K-L, and the osteoprotogeron gene. So rankle and the OP gene are essential to the regulation of the breakdown reabsorption capacity in the bone, right? So that's the instructors that tell the demolition crew to show up. So when I am imbalanced and rankle is amplified and osteoprogeron is amplified, it can lead to increased bone reabsorption. So demolition crew is working overtime, decreased density of the bone, increased fragility and osteoporosis risk. So anything that keeps that up, and again, chronic rampant inflammation will also keep those up. Low density lipoprotein receptor related protein 5, or otherwise known as LRP5. Mutations in the LRP5 gene have been linked to changes in bone density. This involves signaling pathway, which is critical for bone formation. So when this is mutated, the construction crew doesn't show up that day. They'd call in sick, right? So those genes have to do with bone remodeling genes. Well, you know, I was a little bit of a deeper diver when I went back for my PhD. And I wanted to understand also the deeper dive in estrogen and particularly how estrogen gets metabolized as your body gets it packaged in the liver to go out. And if you've listened to me, I talk a lot about this because it's an area that just isn't getting enough attention. So we have three genes that are essentially the very first step in your body taking estrogen and starting to wrap it in wrappers so it can get processed for the trash. So think of detoxification and biotransformation, not as a breaking down of something. So like when I went through school the first time and we started talking about biotransformation and and detoxification, in my head, it was kind of like, I have a chair and one of the legs is broken, so I'm gonna throw it out. So instead of trying to jam the whole chair in the trash can, I'm gonna break the legs off of it 
and make it easier to get in the trash can. Well, that's not really how detox works. Detox works in a way that it says, okay, I'm actually going to wrap wrappers around the chair itself. And once I wrap a couple different wrappers around it, it'll just slide into the trash can more easily. Right. So it's an additive process rather than a breakdown process, which is kind of interesting. And your nutrients play a big role. Your genetics play a big role and amino acids, your B vitamins, your vitamin C, all those things play a role. Right now we have three specific estrogen genes, the CYP3A4, a CYP1B1 and a CYP1A1 gene. So think of these as Goldilocks. One of them is porridge that is way too hot. That's the CYP1B1 gene. One of them is the porridge is too cold, CYP3A4. And then one of them is just right, CYP1A1. And what that does is either so just right, think of that as like a green wrapper. That is the most protective breakdown product of of estrogen. It has the least carcinogenic activity, is the most protective in the body outside of the original estradiol. CYP3A4 isn't great, but it does go from there to get converted into estriol, which is our third form of estrogen. And then CYP1B1 is massive inflammatory. It makes a 4-hydroxyestrone byproduct, which is considered carcinogenic and pro-inflammatory. And when left in the body and unable to get it out, it can cause DNA damage, right? So I have three choices here, right? So let's start with the first one. Let's start with the healthy, right? The green wrapper, CYP1A1 to 2-hydroxyestrone. That is involved, obviously, in in estrogen metabolism and things like environmental toxins. So your herbicides, your pesticides, your phthalates, your plasticizers. CYP1A1 affects estrogen levels through its role in estrogen metabolism. So a highly amplified one can lower estradiol levels, which is the estrogen that is most stimulating and impactful for bone mineral density by hitting that estrogen receptor A1. So if I have excessive activity here, I'm going to have a bigger problem with possibly reduced levels of available estradiol to stimulate bone formation. And that could be a problem. So that CYP1A1 can influence bone health. So what's interesting is, of course, you look at that and you go, well, if that's the cleaner form of estrogen, I want all of it to go through there. But the reality is nothing in our body works like that. Like we have three ways something's supposed to go. You don't want it to all go down one right? We should have a preference, right? And there are different preferences that are good, but it's not like one should only get stimulated, the other two shouldn't. So in the name of the wrappers that I'm talking about here, you have to have some green wrappers, some blue wrappers, and some red wrappers, right? Just the distribution may be a little bit different. So even though CYP1A1 is associated with less, you know, ovarian cancer risk and those kind of things in a cleaner route for estrogen, it may actually have an increased risk of genetically induced osteoporosis in families, right? It has a weak, but it's there, a statistical impact, right? So now let's look at CYP3A4. That's the blue wrapper, right? So that's the kind of cold porridge. It's not awful, but it's not the best rate route, right? So it's, we don't want a bunch of it, but we don't want too little of it. So it also, so this one metabolizes about 50% of the medications on the planet. So what that means is if you're taking other medication, you may be overwhelming this pathway so that you can't ever look at what you're doing in your body and again say, oh, those medications don't matter. They do because they have to get detoxified or biotransformed in the liver. So 50% of medications go through here. I'm not going to go into those today because I could be on for hours. But the CYP3A4 is also involved in the metabolism of vitamin D into its inactive form. So if I have variations in this gene, it may affect D metabolism, which then influences calcium absorption and then bone health, right? And then obviously if I've got medications that I'm doing that are overwhelming this pathway, because maybe I have three or four that the doctor has stacked, this may also affect vitamin D regulation of calcium absorption in a roundabout way. And I guarantee you, Not a single one of your doctors has ever looked at that, right? But it could be a big deal, right? Depending on how you're wired genetically, what else you're pushing down that pathway, right? These hormone pathways are important. And then we have the last one, which is CYP1B1. This is involved in metabolizing estrogen to the 4-hydroxyestrone pathway. And this is considered your less least favorable pathway. And we only want about 7 to 11% of our estrogen passing through this pathway based on research that we have today. So 
This can affect the overall estrogen level and it leaves a pro-inflammatory byproduct for hydroxyestrone that can lead to DNA damage. And so it in itself may influence the risk of osteoporosis because it also affects the availability of estradiol and estrone being available to be made into estradiol. So these estrogen receptor activities and estrogen detox activities can also affect osteoporosis, right? So we can have, like I said, hormone interactions, right? So if we have hormones like estrogen circulating, depending on whether we go down the red pathway or the green pathway, both are going to affect estrogen levels and the availability of estrogen to stimulate osteoblasts, which are the construction crew. If I take medications, chances are many of them are going through that CY3, CYP3, 3A4 gene, and that's going to affect the effect of that gene and its impact on bones. And then obviously environmental factors may make this worse. So how you're wired to get rid of your estrogen makes a difference on how well some of those other aspects of bone mineral density are affected by just being female, right? Now, you may look at that and say, oh gosh, well then would I want to do estrogen replacement as I go through menopause and beyond? Yes, you still do. Because the reality is we can actually see what's happening here by doing urine hormone metabolism, either through a Dutch test or a 24-hour urine hormone metabolism. We can actually see what's happening here in dietary intake of things like broccoli, Brussels sprouts, sephoraphane, and dill and dim and indole three carbonyl found in your in your brassica family food all improve those pathways. Things like hops, your curcumin, your citrus bioflavonoids, grapefruit also positively enhance these pathways. Rosemary, caffeine, haha, it's been vindicated, and even adequate thyroid T4 levels, thyroxine, all of those can impact these pathways. So it's not like we can't manipulate this and make it better. So even if you're like me and you have some pretty cap crappy genes in this pathway, you can still make it better. So our genetics on our estrogen metabolism may also impact my risk for osteoporosis. Now, the other major one I want to talk about is kidneys. So kidneys are the secondary largest cause for bone mineral density and bone changes when we exclude for menopause, right? So if we take that off of the table and start looking at osteoporosis risk, kidneys play a really big role. And that's because they are essential to bone metabolism and your electrolytes and calcium and phosphate, vitamin D levels, and the kidney influences all of that. The kidneys are really intelligent organs, but they can be damaged by lifestyle and other things that will lead to problems. So number one, your kidneys regulate calcium and, and phosphate, right? So calcium and phosphate sort of compete with each other and we need both. You can't have one and not the other, but the kidneys regulate how much we have. And so the kidneys work in a very interesting way. So let's imagine you're going to organize a bunch of stuff in a box, right? So you look in the box and there's a bunch of stuff in there. Now you could do one of two things. You could dump the entire box out on the floor and then put back what you want, or you could rifle through the box, picking out the things that you don't want and just leave in what you do want. How the kidneys work is they are like the first box. They dump everything out of the bloodstream. So they strip everything out and then they add it back. So they regulate calcium and phosphate levels, right? And they regulate the reabsorption of these minerals and maintaining appropriate balance along with the parathyroid hormone, which regulate calcium in the serum and calcitonin, which is a thyroid hormone that regulates calcium also. But the kidneys secondarily can affect it. So if I have what they call hypercalcuria, right, where there's excessive calcium excretion in the urine. So the kidneys are overly excreting calcium. That could be coming from the bones. It could be coming from the diet. It's usually detected in a 24-hour urine catch. It is important that if you are going to do that kind of test that you stop your calcium supplementation if you are taking supplements a couple days beforehand because... You don't want to falsely make it look high because your body's excreting what calcium it couldn't absorb because not all of it gets absorbed, right? But if you're absorbing calcium and you're not taking it, there could be a kidney problem and that would deplete calcium in the bloodstream and also calcium to the bone because the bloodstream is kept very tightly controlled. And so any drop in calcium in the bloodstream is going to cause your body to release parathyroid hormone and basically pull calcium out of the bone. So we want to make sure that we're not losing calcium through the urine because it also affects 
phosphate excretion and that can lead in an imbalance that can affect bone remodeling too because too much phosphorus can also lead to impaired calcium absorption and utilization so that can be a problem too so drinking soft drinks and other things leave too much of that in the system and then you can have calcium loss through the kidneys as well kidneys also convert vitamin d into its active form calcitrol or 125 dihydroxy vitamin d Calcitrol or vitamin D is essential to the absorption of calcium from the intestines, right? So I have to have vitamin D on board to get it out of the intestines and maintaining adequate serum, serum calcium and phosphate levels. So if I don't have enough vitamin D circulating, it's going to affect what the kidneys are up to. And then you add K2 to that, which helps basically pull that calcium away from the blood vessels and arteries into the bone. Kidney disease, right? So if I have chronic kidney disease, so that means that the filter process, so the dumping of everything out of the box and starting to loading it isn't working as well anymore. So maybe the kidneys dump stuff out, but they don't get everything out of the box. And that is usually reflective in a metabolic profile where the bun level may be elevated, which is blood urea nitrogen and creatine or creatinine levels may be a little bit elevated, not creatine, creatinine elevated will be elevated. And then specifically a calculated marker called glomular filtration rate. So when it's over 60, that means the filter at the kidney works. So it's dumping everything out of the box and then bringing back in what it needs to. But if that GFR level starts to drop, let's say it's 58, 50, 40, then you're starting to be staged for kidney disease. And that means it's going to impair calcium absorption and contribute to bone loss and osteoporosis. Mm -hmm. So that can be a huge problem too. And then we also have fibroblast growth factor 23 or FGF 23 is a hormone produced by bone cells that actually regulate phosphate and vitamin D metabolism. The kidneys are the target or organ of this FGF 23. And in kidney disease, Altered signaling can contribute to bone disorders, right? So we could have alterations in this growth factor that now causes bone loss through the kidney function. Um, and then the parathyroid hormone, like I mentioned, parathyroid comes from the parathyroid gland, which are little round glands that sit on your thyroid gland and they release PTH. And PTH swings according to how much calcium is available in the bloodstream and this other hormone called calcitonin from the thyroid. So those two regulate it. So they sort of seesaw back and forth. Well, if we get increased PTH secretions because of either a benign tumor or just abnormal function, it'll start excreting calcium from the bone, right? So those there is a little relationship between kidney function and parathyroid. And then kidneys also maintain the acid alkaline balance, right? So a lot of people are concerned on I'm too acidic and if I eat too much sugar and not enough vegetables, I'm gonna be acidic. And yes, to some degree, diabetes in particular causes acidity in the body because we have both fat mobilized in the bloodstream and we have sugar and we have insulin resistance and we have pH goes of the blood goes down. So we become more inflammatory. However, the kidneys maintain acid alkaline balance along with the pancreas excretion of sodium bicarbonate into the small intestines. So there's a lot more to being acidic than just getting green juices and balancing out magnesium and your electrolytes, right? The kidneys maintain it. And if the kidneys are impaired and affecting the actual filtration in the body, we are going to be more likely to have abnormal acid alkaline base and also increased risk for osteoporosis. And so we also, so kidneys can play a significant role. Now, the very last one I want to talk about is more in line with the functional medicine community also. So obviously my team, when we're looking at people with osteoporosis, we're looking at all of this. This is round one of let's figure out why we're losing bone because the reality is it's never just one thing. It's just like anything else. It's think of your body as like a bucket and we have a bunch of faucets feeding the bucket. Some of them are on and some of them are off. We have to figure out how many faucets are turned on causing the problem and which ones we do need to modulate and turn off and which ones we might need to just turn down or turn up, right? So malabsorption and leaky gut. So if I have poor digestion, malabsorption, enzyme deficiency, poor fat digestion because of poor gallbladder function, or even lack of dietary fiber and the food for your good microbiome, because they actually produce things like short chain fatty acids, which is their food source just from the fiber you eat. And those things actually get out, they, they come out of the intestines into the bloodstream and modulate things like rankle. So 
even having fiber in your diet can influence osteoporosis risk. Your microbiome influences osteoporosis risk. Your ability to absorb nutrients is going to be uh, impacted by leaky gut factors and digestive function. So the other part, as we look at that foundational level of risk for osteoporosis, a good old functional medicine workup works, right? We have to understand how well the body operates because it doesn't matter how much calcium you eat if you can't absorb it. It doesn't matter how much protein you get in if you don't metabolize it properly. And the ground zero really starts in the gut. So looking at the gut also is really important because again, we have a lot of people that might be doing all the right things, maybe even taking the right supplements, but are you getting them, right? Are you getting them to where they need to go? Number one, I just covered a ton of genes that may be affecting that and other metabolic reasons why their things may be affecting it. But at the very basic level, understanding how your digestion works, even if you're not symptomatic, is also what I would consider a baseline. So poor dietary intake, poor dietary function and digestive function over time is going to cause a loss of bone mineral density as well, just because your body can't build something it doesn't get, right? Those nutrients are essential. It can't do something that it's not getting, you know, so that's the problem with the standard American diet and why we see such an increase in just all cause mortality and diseases is it's devoid of nutrients and full of empty calories. So our body is hungrier because it's still asking for nutrients. And we have disease processes plowing around in the background because they're not getting the appropriate nutrition that they really need. So to sort of recap here, there are a lot of reasons why somebody, and particularly a woman, may get osteoporosis. Men can too. So as men age, bone loss can happen, particularly as they lose testosterone. Men on testosterone therapy who are given estrogen blocking drugs can also get osteoporosis because again, we need estrogen to stimulate the bone building process. Testosterone does that, but not as strongly. And research shows that men who are on estrogen blockers, for whatever reason, often because they're on replacement and they don't want it to be made into estrogen because we have an enzyme called aromatase that takes testosterone in both men and women and makes it to estrogen. And so sometimes they'll block that. Well, you want to tamp it down. You don't want to block it completely because it may end up causing you some bone problems later on in life. So even those things, men, especially if they have problems like cancers, like multiple myeloma, they will also experience bone loss. But generally men don't see it as much because they're bigger in stature, bigger bones, more muscle mass, right? So obviously we have just those factors. We have being female, your age, the inflammatory activity that you may have your lifestyle factors like inactivity, smoking, excess alcohol consumption, being severely underweight or malnourished, vegetarian, vegan history. There's a bunch of nutrient deficiencies and and especially protein and some of your fat soluble forms of K that are very hard to get as a vegetarian or vegan. And unless you're the most conscientious, like work it like it's your job, vegetarian, vegan, it is hard now after seeing as many women with osteoporosis that I've seen who have vegetarian histories and particularly vegan history that have bone mineral density problems. It's just you, if you want to do that, I totally respect it. You just need to really get tested and figure out what you need to take supplementally and continue to do so because you cannot get some of those nutrients through vegetarian forms. It just doesn't exist, right? So that's really important. And again, I respect one of my best friends in the world is vegan. It's like, she's never going to do it. And I totally get it. But I'm like, I'm cool with that. Just take the right nutrients so you don't make yourself sick, right? But you just know that it's really difficult to do to get all everything you really need. And then know that your genes may be at cause, right? So checking for some of these other genes is a little more esoteric than your commercial genetic tests. But there are ways to look for these and find out what genes you may have that may be contributing. A lot of times you can just look through your family and see if that's it. And then really look at kidney function. Again, kidneys are so very vital to the function of our body and particularly the regulation of bone metabolism that they often get kind of overlooked. And so I hope you found this number one informative, right? Even if you don't have osteoporosis today, I certainly hope you don't. I hope this was really helpful in giving you some 
armament to work on it. Because the reality is even if you're at a point right now where you don't have it, your risks go up as you get older. So it is, even if it's not on the radar today, will eventually be on the radar later on if you aren't doing some of the things I talked about today, just because statistically that happens as we get older. All right. So I hope you enjoyed this episode of Menopause Mastery. I'll be back with you next week. If you found this session helpful at all, please share it with a friend. And if I can ask you to do two really awesome things for me, it would mean the world to me. Absolutely the world to me is number one. If you see the little subscribe button, wherever you're listening to me, if you hit that subscribe button, what it does is it helps us rank. And that becomes really important because that helps more people find this podcast right? So that helps me get better guests and all kinds of other fun stuff. And number two, if you leave me a review, that's also really helpful because reviews help people figure out if they want to listen to a podcast. And so your review means so very much to me. And so thank you so much. I hope you're having a wonderful week and I'll see you next week. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Menopause Mastery Podcast. You are why I'm here and I am so very grateful. Hit subscribe so you don't miss any wisdom on creating the most exceptional life on our terms. If this episode has helped you in any way, please share it with a friend to spread the love and together we rise. You can follow me on social media at Betty Murray PhD and you can reach me online at BettyMurray.com. 